And I would like to welcome both our presenters and thank them both for presenting today. We have with us today, Dr. Wolfram Elsner, has, and who has been a professor of economics at the University of Bremen, Germany since 1995. He has worked as a head of regional economic development at city level between 1986 and 1990 and as a director of the planning division of the Ministry of Economic Affairs of the state of Bremen and the state, uh, state government's Economic Research Institute. He was president of the European Association for Evolutionary Political Economy from 2012 to 2014, and again, 2014 to 2016. He taught and researched at a number of universities in Europe, the United States, Mexico, China, South Africa, and Australia. He has served on the editorial boards of a number of international ac academic journals on many committees of heterodox academic associations, edited books and book series, and published numerous articles in international journals. He was the managing director of the Forum for Social Economics between 2012 and 2018, and has been editor in chief, chief of the Review of Evolutionary Political Economy since 2018. So without further ado, Thank you very much for presenting today and I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Iris. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, so let me struggle with the technique. This one should work. So I hope you can see it. Uh, and I go to the presentation mode and have to minimize all the other stuff on the screen so that I can see my slides. Okay, I hope uh, it's visible for you. Uh, this is about collapse as was announced. Um, and what I do is combine things in order to, to approach, uh, what does it say? Attendants can see my my application now. Okay. Uh, in order to um, approach this relatively new uh, and quite topical uh, uh, theme and complex theme, of course, what I do is combining uh, good old institutional evolutionary uh, economics and perspectives with some more, well, in the background, formal and analytical a complexity perspectives. You will see how this works. And I come out with something that uh, should help us um, and should, should help social economy, social economists, institutionalists, other heterodoxes to a better approach that topical theme and to meddle in in the in the ongoing uh, uh, political and societal discussions on particularly climate change and all that, so what I what I uh, try to put forward is that and how and in which way institutional uh, institutions institutional arrangements cultures so to speak um, uh, are mutually interacting with the social economy and the social economic ecological conditions so uh, this is what i want to uh, present to you the topicality of collapse real world crisis declines collapses the relative uh, negligence of collapse and economics um, in mainstream anyway but also in uh, in some heterodoxies who that 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 have not yet fully approached, um, in my view, um, this important uh, uh, subject field. They are preoccupied, mainstream is preoccupied with growth, uh, cycles perhaps, uh, development, uh, complexities with emergence, uh, but all are uh, not fully uh, focused yet on, on issues of collapse while at the same time there's a high theoretical significance of the theme um, there is no socio-economic ecological system without institutional systems and arrangements and that means no socio-economic ecological decline and collapse without institutional decline and collapse so two things i uh, try to elaborate a bit um, and um, we 
may discuss, of course, things um, later um, today. And of course, you can read it in, in, a, in a long paper that has been published uh, last March in the Journal of Economic Issues. The first one is endogeneity of institutional decline and collapse. So it is so far um, social sciences and sciences have dealt, mainly the sciences have dealt with, with collapses in, in, in the history of humankind or the history of, 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 of the earth. Um, but um, these collapses were always, uh, you know, triggered by, by erratic uh, ex external shocks. So what I put forward is the endogeneity thesis, institutional cooperation itself. Uh, and its it, it, its cooperation success um, does breed a weakening of the success factors: growth, uh, outward um, uh, expansion, migration, uh, much more uh, emigrations um, professionally and 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 business style emigrations. Also, if the society gets more attractive through its success. Um, there are very much, uh, very many more heterogeneous immigration uh, immigrants uh, come. So in all larger turbulence, larger complexity, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, on top of that, uneven distribution of the of the of the of the uh, performance effects of of that success, with. Um, social conflicts, subsequent social conflicts, and all in all, then uh, increasing mass uh, defection um, because of, of something that, that uh, triggers a myopia and so on. I will go to into that. The second thesis is about asymmetry of collapse uh, over emergence. So it's not just a symmetric thing. The, uh, institutions develop, emerge and develop and the, the same process and same conditionality, they, 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 they uh, break down and collapse. Not at all. Um, the very conditions of emergence, I will argue, um, imply that there is some institutional hysteresis. Uh, hysteresis sorry. Uh, which further deteriorates decision making uh, quality and in a mutual interaction between the, the um, downgoing performance, uh, socioeconomic, ecological reform uh, performance, then cause uh, first a delayed, relatively delayed collapse, but then an even faster one. Uh, in the end, I will briefly um, uh, resume the Veblenian aspect of that. Uh, Veblen's argument has always been in so-called predatory societies. We have received ceremonial, so-called ceremonial institutions, which have to do with uh, or are motivated and, and, and have a, a value warrant uh, by um, differential power and, and status. Um, uh, aspirations, and so there is uh, there is no appropriate instrumental institutional adaptation of, of institutional arrangements, uh, even if uh, conditions change and there's pressure for institutions to uh, properly adapt and smoothly adapt and adapt in time. Uh, I conclude briefly then. So the topicality, uh, I don't have to say very much on that. Crisis, socioeconomic, cultural, institutional decline and collapse have been ubiquitous uh, in human prehistory and history and in, in the, our car current uh, conditions, even more so. We, our impression probably will be, we, we agree, we all would agree that the issue as such has uh, gained more uh, higher topicality in recent uh, decades, I would say. So <clears throat> I have some some uh, picks uh, picked out uh, some some literature picked out on 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 that. There's huge literature in the sciences and also in some anthropological uh, uh, a number of anthropological and paleontological uh, uh, research uh, well known is, is Jared Diamond 
um, 2005, uh, for instance, or all the diamonds books and 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 articles, and and uh, Peter Turchin, of course, uh, just with a number of, of things, and he is just in the in the internet uh, on on a collapse, for instance, in Afghanistan, uh, very very topical, as you see. So uh, we have heard in recent decades about failing states, breakdown of local cultures, international. Also, I go to the core of everything and would even uh, claim that that there's internet, the international neoliberal, uh, neo neoliberal has uh, has had these and is having these destructive uh, consequences um, as it destroyed the required social balance between collectivity and individuality that that each society needs um, in favor of, of pure uh, so-called individuality and hyper individualism and hyper rationality and hyper short termism uh, uh, etc and 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 um, the winner takes all uh, cultures and so on. So uh, this, in Veblenian terms, this, this would be an increase under neoliberalism uh, of not only financialization, but with financialization, the financialization, all that that I mentioned, uh, of ceremonial institutions. Globalization patterns at the uh, expense of, of social capital um, and the environmental, ecological capital. So increasing um, local and global uh, disasters, uh, I observe droughts, floods, heat waves, et cetera, et cetera, which are not just and no longer just external um, uh, er erative uh, um, uh, uh, shocks or so, um, but are heavily uh, interconnected with uh, with uh, social inequalities, migration, deterioration of all these conditions that uh, uh, individuals uh, still can accommodate uh, cognitively. So what 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 we see is people are overwhelmed cognitively because they feel overstressed. They feel. Uh, uh, um, uh, over complexity and they often feel over turbulence and in a in a uh, in a counter motion a polanian po counter motion you could say they they turn into conservatism conservatism and and into uh more stricter uh, behaviors against any uh, progressive change etc cetera, etc cetera. so um I don't need to go deeper into this. You see the you see the all these keywords here: the migration crisis, wars, of course, hungers, diseases, etc. And it looks like that nowadays uh, the international community is uh, dealing worse uh, rather than better uh, with our. Uh, global commons in 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 a large in a large in a, in a broad sense so with the ecological commons but also with the social commons uh, that that we share the pandemic would would uh would provide a more uh, and more recent and topical uh, uh substance to this uh just one hint for australia the huge australian wildfires uh, last year i had um in, invited lynn chester from australia uh to write something on that and we had in the review of evolution of political economy um uh, earlier this year um no not earlier this year late last year um uh, a paper of her that ideally uh, shows the interconnection between that wildfire, apparently natural disaster, and the social and political disaster that that it uh, that is connected, that has been connected with it, and and made things worse and much more worse. Worse. Okay. So. Um, Sciences, as said, um, have so far mainly exogenous, exogenous explanations uh, with focus on discretionary shocks uh, and with uh, Diamond, Jared Diamond, uh, Peter, Peter Turchin, for instance, uh, the two leading, one of the two leading 
uh, anthropologists, um, they focus on formal institutions more, so on the state and and bureaucracies and, and hierarchies, uh, et cetera, with usually a one-sided uh, causality, mainly the shocks uh, uh, come externally and, and the direction, the impact direction is on the formal institutions and they, for some reason, do not adapt adequately. Now, what I try to put forward is that uh, there's no socioeconomic decline or socioeconomic ecological decline and breakdown without informal, informal institutional um, means cultural value decline and breakdown. So we have mutual causations. The negligence is, uh, is a, a uh, uh, quite obvious, I think. The mainstream still focus on growth business cycles at, at most on development post Keynesian, on business crisis, economic stagnation, perhaps e eco ecological economics on desired degrowth. For instance, uh, evolutionary institutional economics so far on institutional lock in. Um, which was called, has been called in the tradition of Veblen and Ayers and, and, and John Fack Foster and, and Paul Dale Bush uh, on ceremonial encapsulation, um, regressive institutional change, Marxian uh, political economy on system crisis, revolutions, uh, complexity economics on institutional emergence, but also on systems dynamics like uh, so-called deterministic chaos, uh, phase transitions into chaos, um, uh, phase transitions into, into overcomplexity, then crisis, uh, and then going back to under complexity and all this that we know from, from, from uh, complexity uh, systems, agent-based modeling and, and their simulations um, uh, and, their, and the dynamics that they found out. Um, uh, even systems may, uh, may uh, reside for some time in, 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 in unfavorable attractors and stay for, the, for them for some time, but not forever, of course. Um, so that we all know, um, but still this all, I would say, is not partic particularly collapse. Uh, so we will combine the Blanian and complexity economic perspectives, as said, and uh, look at institutional emergence versus degeneration uh, uh, and on the co-evolutionary decline of, uh, of uh, co-evolutionary decline and collapse between institutions and, and social economy and ecology. Now, the theoretical significance, as said, uh, I've said it already, so I can quickly jump over it, that no social economy without institutions, no ecology without institutions, no real world social economic ecological breakdown without institutional decline and breakdown. Important um, is their mutual causality and or co-evolution. Uh, and the message then would be uh, modern heterodox institutional analysis has a lot to say to the current forms of decline and collapse and should meddle into the ongoing political uh, and so societal discussions on that. Ideally, as a benchmark, so to speak, in a Weblanian perspective and a Weblanian slash uh, complexity perspective, there would be a fully problem-solving instrumental institutional arrangement uh, based on a, on a societal uh, um, basis or culture, so to speak, of an instrumental value work. So if, if society was not a predatory, um, uh, a hierarchical, uneven uh, society, we would ideally, in, Veblenian, in a Veblenian perspective, ideally have a, a full-fledged a problem-solving attitude, so a, a, a fact-based uh, uh, attitude and evidence-based attitude uh, where society looks based on facts and science and recognition, uh, looks for instrumental, truly problem-solving 
um, solutions uh, and, and, and shapes its institutions accordingly. That means institutions, for instance, worldwide institutions that would be able to deal with the commons uh, that we have and the commons that are going down. So, uh, you know, look at the, the global commons. Uh, we don't have any clue to, to, uh, to deal with uh, uh, with uh, the pandemic, nor with climate change, nor with any other uh, things. The, the globalization has gone astray. Uh, um, it, 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 there, there is deglobalization. There is a hugely uneven development uh, in the world. Um, it, it, there are uh, 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 value added chains breaking down, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All the current, all the current things that 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 are in the newspapers now. Um, let's take this as a, as a as a benchmark. Uh, it, uh, under these good conditions, better con conditions uh, that Veblen never has elaborated very much because he was focused on the on the predatory historical received uh, institutional arrangements and societies, um, and they were ceremonially dominated. Um, but in, in an ideal positive case, uh, there would be always a proper uh, and timely adaptation of society and its uh, institutional arrangements to deal with the uh, with the collective problems of our commons, be it at local, regional, national, continental, or global uh, levels, and in proper time horizons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, in that respect, we could say, and Veblen would perfectly agree to say Diamond and, and Turchin to say uh, that there was failure to a failure to adapt. Um, um, uh, Tainter, did I just say uh, Tainter? Oh, I, I use Tainter here. Of course, Tainter is another another important person in that, and Jared Diamond, and I forgot uh, Turchin here. Um, yeah, so uh, there, there, there is failure, but uh, the analysis analysis of that failure needs to be uh, needs to be uh, constructed from bottom up anew. I would say, uh, and this is the that was the motivation of of my paper and the theoretical conceptualization that I tried in the March Journal of Economic Issues paper. So analytical modeling from, from complexity science, we have that benchmark, little benchmark model of, of, of the super game solution of a, of a long-term uh, iterated uh, social dilemma thing that is combined with uh, evolutionary game theory and put into a number of many, many, many uh, dozens of, of, of uh, models now and, 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 and simulation runs uh, and papers, hundreds of papers probably, uh, that have dealt on that basis um, and uh, um, showed um, on the one hand uh, institutional emergence. Um, and I did something in, in a 2012 paper in the, uh, on evolutionary institutional game theory, uh, EIGT, uh, in the Journal of Economic Issues on Institutional Change, revisited um, after 25 years because Paul Dale Bush's famous paper of 1870, uh, I formalized a bit at that at that time. So um, there are recurrent interaction processes and the short run dominance of egoistic incentives. So uh, we have a we have a full fledged social dilemmas here. Um, so people would in a in a short run, I, I, I put it in a nutshell, of course. So I, I avoided in this presentation any formalism. Um, and that is has a disadvantage, of course, because you at points you have to be, just believe me, <laughs> uh, and I cannot show it uh, formally and 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 show the background of of of, of the argument here. Um, but the social dilemmas um, means that um, that agents always have an egoistic incentive uh, for short run maximization rather than uh, offering cooperation, as they would lose while one sided offering uh, 
uh, cooperation. So there's no solution basically in a, in a neoclassical sense. The, 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 the point is the evolutionary institutional interpretation of it was then that there uh, uh, a whole process of cultural development, social learning, expectations building, trust building, commitment, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, must co-evolve. And that relates back to the early 80s uh, and the shorter Robert Axelrod in the mid 80s. Bold Skinties have done a lot on that uh, over the 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s and later. So in all there's a difficult evolutionary convergence process for the emergence of rules of coordination. And we make a distinction between rules of coordination based on simple um, coordination more simple coordination problems, right, left driving on the street or so, where you see there are different solutions for the same problem and why and how do come the, uh, the one or the other solution about. That is a, already a very difficult uh, thing, um, but more difficult even is the emergence of institutions where we have uh, uh, sanction mechanisms built in uh, in order to bring about cooperation, which is more than just coordination, because in coordination, it is your immediate uh, in, uh, interest to be coordinated with the other while uh, uh, it is not your never your immediate egoistic interest, short run interest to cooperate with the other as soon as you know the other one cooperates in a neoclassical sense, starting setting, so, so to speak. Uh, the agent would have an incentive uh, exactly not to cooperate. So, um, a, a dominating uh, a short run egoistic incentive, social dilemma analysis. Uh, the, the solutions to come about in that co evolutionary societal and cultural process uh, would be highly idiosyncratic, uh, conditional, vulnerable, uh, and, and prone to, to a, a backslash, etc. So, success factors then that have usually developed over many dozens of, 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 of models and, and, uh, and simulation runs and, and papers uh, everywhere um, is that uh, there's a co-evolution co of, of information and expectations uh, conditioned to the size of the interaction arena. So with how many people do I have to interact? Uh, how many people do I mean? Uh, the, the size relates to what is a, a, has been a large theme in evolutionary institutional uh, economics, uh, recognized interdependence. So many people would say simply, and I would, would, would agree today that uh, that one dimension of the, of, the, of the global problems we have is that uh, the recognized interdependence, the feedback between my own actions and the actions of the other uh, punishing me for uh, if I destroy um, uh, environment with my behavior, uh, it's not, not, no longer given. Uh, it has been given in the small communities of the hunters gatherers, you know, where our brain uh, was shaped. Uh, and our co co cognitive capacity was shaped uh, and coined, but we we are have grown far uh, beyond these conditions of size and interactions arenas, and are uh, more or less uh, permanently cognitively overwhelmed, um, unless we come, you know, through uh, through a process of of, of rational discussion and and making ourselves conscious of our conditions, et cetera, and, and decide collectively on a, on a new political agenda, et cetera, then we could perhaps try to, to, uh, to get it. But you see the entire environmental uh, movements uh, are, are uh, struggling for decades already and have not really um, uh, uh, succeeded in, in, in changing anything so far except we have more public discussion on it, but not in the reality. Um, okay, so uh, longer run rationality, as said, needs to be, uh, needs to be uh, evolving, uh, extended time horizons and the calculation of over longer time horizons 
uh, may change then the entire rationality of our decisions. Uh, we need time for that. We need time for interactions, for learning, for habituation, for generalizations in ourselves of, of rules, et cetera, and rules and institutions. And we need a culture co-evolving here with, an, with a dominating uh, instrumental value basis. But cooperation success, as we will see in the, in, in the analytical, uh, the analytical argument is that the very cooperation success then breeds the, the very weakening of these success factors, um, uh, excessive growth, out, growth, outward expansion, immigration, emigration, immigration, turbulence, uneven distribution and social conflict, growing complexity, gr cognitive overstress and short-termism with resulting in uh, anxiousness, short-termism, myopia, uh, conservatism, uh, and increasing defection of, of people. And that is what we see in many, many societies, particularly also in the, in the US, but also in Germany, uh, in all uh, and more or less in all major Western societies. Um, Eastern, I don't know. Um, now, and second, uh, the, the, the institutional hysteresis um, uh, uh, then, which I will uh, uh, explain in the next slide, uh, further deteriorates the quality of societal uh, decision making as the pressure increases for, ins uh, for appropriate institutional uh, change, but institutional hysteresis uh, prevents exactly that. So it deteriorates the quality of the societal decision making further. Uh, and with this, then socioeconomic performance and ecological conditions. Now, the institutional hysteresis, very briefly, um, if you look at the analytical process of emergence of problem solving in informal institutions, uh, this implies um, in a lot in the logic implies high and risky time and effort investment. You need to offer cooperation, but if you do, you have a high risk being exploited uh, at least once uh, until the other one uh, then perhaps learns to cooperate as, as well. Um, and in the end, if you have been uh, uh, exploited in the first interaction at the end of the day, and from then on a, a common cooperation starts at the end of the day, the other one will be better off than you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is uh, of course, a lot of, lot of uh, modeling in, 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 in substance, in, in the essence, there are high sunk fixed the sunk fixed costs of, of emerging institutions. And that implies that, uh, that uh, with uh, the application of institutions of cooperation, we have high economies of scale of institutional decision making. I will illustrate that in a minute. Uh, therefore, that means uh, established, old, even outmoded and petrified institutions uh, are no longer warranted by some new real world factor constellation. If the new factor constellation has become more uh, complex and the pressure increases for institutional change, it will not take place uh, because the established institution still has lower current transaction costs than a potential new and more appropriate institution. So this is exactly institutional hysteresis, uh, it, it increases, it contributes further to the inappropriateness of societal institutional decision making. Here's the, uh, the, the little inst uh, illustration, uh, a kind of uh, um, uh, cost function, uh, uh, um, Average, average cost of decision of societal decision making. We have the phase of emerging institutions where, where uh, the institutions, uh, institutional decision making decreases. We have a, a phase of the uh, establishing of the institution and then conditions may change. And then we have uh, an the phase of increasing institutional hysteresis that prevents the new institution that would ha have higher costs still, perhaps later on, definitely later on not, uh, but it prevents the institutional change to come. Um, so there's mutual causal, uh, uh, causal interactions. Um, again, very briefly, I've said that all. Uh, Where's my 
where's my pointer here? Okay, let's see. Um, the, de the, the very success breeds the decay of the success factors, growth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all said about that. So the increasing complexity of, of, the, of the objective environment is, will be unmet and the loss of recognized interdependence and feedback is there. Uh, and 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 there there will uh, be no institutional uh, progressive institutional change towards uh, instrumentalism or problem solving uh, culture. It gets ever more pressing, and the institutional hysteresis um, uh, further deteriorates this situation. Uh, and uh, uh, institutional change, if at all, will be delayed or will be even blocked. And then this will be a, a circle with further deterioration, mutual uh, 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 interaction and co-evolution and increases the, the pressure. Um, coming to the uh, yeah, final argument, uh, in, in short, institutional hysteresis and co-evolution with the real world, deteriorating real world conditions and performance uh, uh, will imply a belated but then even faster collapse. And this is just in order to, uh, to avoid more argumenting here, uh, the paper of course is full with much more uh, substantial argument and examples. Um, so I just uh, picked the the illustration I had. Um, the the red one is the the assumed um, uh, path of of the um, institution, and um, the blue one is the assumed path of the socio-economic ecological. Uh, uh, conditions and performance. So the blue one is the real world factors, uh, the red one, the institutional uh, performance. And you see here is a, a kind of, in this phase, we have a kind of, no, not only in this phase, but from here to here, we have a positive feedback loop, a negative co-evolution of both. Now, uh, briefly, I come to the end, the Veblenian aspect. Uh, once again, I mentioned that um, Veblen's perspective was we have historically received the predatory societies with dominant, dominating inadequate, uh, uh, inadequate outmoded institutions uh, and dominating ceremonial uh, value warrant. I would say this is a more topical than ever, uh, or has become more topical than ever, under neoliberalism. And uh, we know that Veblen himself and most of the, uh, uh, the institutionalists in the 20th century have been extremely uh, uh, skeptical about uh, options for uh, progressive institutional change. Um, and the, the Bush paper of 1987, I, I really recommend still to read that. Uh, because he has so many good examples, and I, I added examples in my 2012 papers uh, on on that uh, on Bush uh, on Bush's shoulders, so to speak. Um, yeah, but this is yeah the the particularly important here is the ceremonial encapsulation. So you have basically you might have clear. Uh, progressive institutional change, you might have clear uh, regressive uh, institutional change, but the usual, the usual thing is that has Bush uh, particularly nicely developed is the case in between that is something, a, a rough idea with Babylon already and heirs, the ceremonial encapsulation. So you have uh, a society that still has the, uh, the ceremonial uh, uh, values uh, dominating, uh, but of course, at the same time, there is not knowledge progress, and the knowledge progress, the, the increase in the knowledge fund, so to speak, uh, will be always a deformed and 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 uh, um, if, if encapsulated by ceremonial uh, uh, use and 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 ceremonial degeneration. So we have kind of of uh, um, 
pseudo process on the one or pro progress on the one hand, pseudo progress on the other hand, uh, uh, knowledge progress with no societal or blocked societal progress, so to speak, or institutional progress, so to speak. That is a very important uh, thing that I think uh, heterodox economists should be uh, using much more. Um, and uh, such, what I, uh, yeah, uh, suggesting this does suggest an increasing institutional inadequacy, decreasing societal decision quality. Uh, that is the result that I wanted to, to show. Uh, uh, an ongoing, what uh, Veblen called or Murdahl called circular cumulative causation. Uh, towards decline and breakdown. And you know, Veblen had the circular, uh, Veblen had the cumulative causation notion. Uh, uh, Murdahl worked on that from the 1940s on and, and showed uh, processes on the, the, uh, the so called Negro problem in the US and the, and, and, and the, the, the worldwide um, uh, uh, problems with the, the third world, et cetera. And with his, his huge studies, uh, uh, he developed the idea of the circular cumulative causation. Now I come to conclude. Um, heterodox institutional economics and socioeconomics has potentially a lot to contribute to the analysis and thus the potential mitigation of current crises and the increasing declines and, and collapses we are observing. Uh, we, we, we are forced to observe. Um, heterodox institutional economics therefore should focus more on processes of decline and, 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 and collapse and meddle with uh, societal and ongoing societal and policy debates on mitigating institutional cultural breakdowns and climate collapse. I'm pretty sure that, um, that uh, Marxist uh, political economists in the broadest sense would say, ha would have to say a lot more and say, yeah, you cannot do that as long as you have, you know, these structures of the economy and, 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 and politics, etc. So political, econo uh, political economic analysis would add something more here. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, this is um, um, something that that I think uh, we heterodoxes in in a large sense, uh, in a broad sense, heterodoxes applying institutional analysis, applying uh, perhaps uh, complexity perspectives. Um, and my my paper in two thousand seventeen, uh, no, in uh, less. Um, my paper in 2017 in the Journal of Economic Issues are, are on complexity as heterodoxy uh, would be would come in here saying, look, uh, if we take complexity serious, uh, we are we ha we have an advantage as heterodox economists and should uh, make more use of it. Uh, so we have a potential here to uh, both in uh, analytical uh, in the analytical realm and in the political societal uh, debates. That would be my message, so to say. Uh, thank you for your patience. And this is the paper uh, on, on collapse uh, in the March issue of the uh, Journal of Economic Issues. Thank you very much. I hope I was in time. Perfect timing. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. It was very interesting. Next, and we will have a Q&A session and time for that um, at the end of our next presentation. So if you have questions, please either put them in the chat or ask them directly when we get to the Q&A session. So thank you again, Dr. Wolfram Elsna. And now we have Dr. Prabhupan Pratumchat, who is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Wisconsin Superior. She earned her PhD in economics from the University of Utah. Her research interests are on macroeconomics, fiscal and monetary policy, as well as social inequality. Her latest publications are Homelessness and Housing Market in the United States, and How Effective is the 2020 Stimulus Check in Minnesota and Wisconsin, Wisconsin counties. She's currently working on the issue of rising inequality from the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States 
and Thailand. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Prao Pan and thank you for presenting. Thanks, Iris. Um, thanks for having me in this session. It is my honor to be in the same session with Wolfram, who is basically legend of political economy. <laughs> I am very new to this issue. Uh, like uh, Iris mentioned, I normally work on macro economy, um, Keynesian, things like that. So this is my very first time to touch on um, more towards political economy, institutional eco uh, economic framework. Um, so my, let me share my screen. Okay. I hope you see my screen. Yes. Okay, good. So my topic today is about Thailand inequality and the shock from COVID-19, so-called exogenous shock. And the phenomena in Thailand right now is the rising of the youth democracy movement, which uh, started in 2020. So my background a little bit about this is, um, I used to be, in the past, I used to be uh, one of the protester in the past and I just want to understand what's going on in Thailand right now uh, with the military government. Well, they won't call themselves military government because they had the election, but again, the, the party that uh, won the election didn't get to form the government, but another party that come from the military uh, end up forming the government in 2017. So I am calling them military government. And with everything, um, the exogenous chalk um, and a lot of poor and middle-class people together with the younger generation uh, rising to request for more you know, equality in the, in the society. So I just want to understand what's going on in this. Um, I have three main questions. The first one I just want to see is Thailand inequality growing after the latest military coup in 2014. So it has been um, seven years since the latest coup. Uh, you imagine if you are, if you were um, 13 in 2014, right now you become, you know, 20. So those are uh, younger generation life. They have been living with this uh, regime for, for quite some time. And the second question is, what is the effect of COVID-19, especially to middle-class and the poor? And I want to link this together. Can inequality and poverty and the shock of COVID-19 explain the movement that uh, started in 2020 and still keep, you know, right now it's going on. Uh, my framework, I look around and <laughs> normally I uh, read a lot of Asamuglu work already. So I feel like Asamuglu uh, framework can fit somewhat into this situation. So the basic idea is how the distributional consequences of economic development help to explain patterns of democracy and dictatorship and the movement in, in the society. So I basically used Darren as a McClure and James Robinson, 2001, 2006, and Carl Boyce in two, uh, 2003. And some people call them redistributivist theory of regime change. So they are looking at the inequality impacts, voters demand for distribution, when inequality is high, what happened to elites, uh, middle class and the poor, right? Um, the implication from this model is when the society is not in the political equilibrium in a sense is 
uh, they're talking a lot about tax preference. So basically the elites or the wealthy doesn't, don't want to pay tax too high because they say they are the one who pay tax. So their preference of the tax is zero, right? Why the poor or the middle class that is uh, kind of lower middle class may say, we want high tax because we want more uh, welfare policy or distributive policy. So there are different preference in, in the tax. So if the current set of policy is not what majority of people want, there might be some chance of social unrest or movement or revolution. Even though in uh, the non-democracy uh, society, the citizen could have political power in that. If they pose a credible threat of revolution or their movement could cause damage to uh, elite class who control the de jure power. So uh, the re revolution const constraint will be binding if a lot of people join together, right? And normally middle class and the poor are you know, greater in number. So if they join together and prefer a revolution, that will that would work, that will move to society to some uh, more of the equal uh, society. However, there are some uh, other uh, economists argue about that. They said this thesis would hold if other factor didn't dilute the impacts of voter national demand. For example, this is uh, mentioned in Ansel and Samuels in 2014. For example, the elites could have uh, some power in terms of money, you know, to tilt the playing field, flooding the politics with money, or they can shape the poor political beliefs, middle class belief through the ownership of mass media. Especially these days, we have social media and uh, it can be, you know, um, distorted by some um, some issue, some some method, and it there could be some factor from ethnicity or religion that could uh, change the political beliefs and impact the voters' natural demand for redistribution. So, from this framework, I just want to see what's happening in Thailand. So the very first one, let's look at Thailand's inequality. The classic um, inequality measurement in, you know, in mainstream is Gini income, Gini coefficient, right? If you look at Thailand's Gini coefficient over time, starting from uh, 1962 to 2018, you can see slightly drop which means it's getting better. Uh, so it's, it's a good picture if you are a government officer and you know, presenting to, to the prime minister, it, it will look good because it's, it's dropping over time. And uh, I put the line there to, to tell you a little bit more of the situation, political situation in Thailand. The latest one is 2014 coup. Cool. Um, it was for, to destroy the government of Ying Lak. Ying Lak is the female prime minister, the first female prime minister um, uh, in Thailand. And before that, we had another coup, 2006 coup, to uh, overthrow Thaksin's government, uh, who was very popular in Thailand during that time. He uh, he had a lot of policy towards the lower middle income families and the poor. He has the universal health care. He set up the, the funding for village. Like every village, you have 1 million baht to start up your own business or, you know, fix your business problem, things like that. So he was very popular among the poor and the middle class during that time. And then it become, you know, 
threatening factors to to the elites and especially elites has very close relationship with the military in Thailand. So they staged the 2006 coup. And then Ying Lap is actually Thaksin's sister. She, after another election, she come up again, which means a lot of people still want Thaksin's um, policy. And then we again have the military coup in 2014. So you can see it is dropping, which means it's it's pretty good picture for Thailand in the long term. After 2014, um, it was up and down. So we can't really conclude anything from this picture from the Gini coefficient. So I look deeper into each group of income. This is income share of different income group by DESO. Uh, from socioeconomic survey in Thailand, you see that top 20% um, starting from, oops, sorry. I think it's 1982, uh, it's dropping, right? They used to share 50% of income and now they share around 40 something percent, the wealthiest 20%. The middle class, both lower middle and upper middle, they both have a little bit higher share of the income in Thailand. After the coup, it, you don't really see much change, but the poor, you can see their life haven't changed in you know, 40 years, things like that. They have been in around 8% or 7% of the total income share in, in the economy. So again, this is, just the income picture in Thailand. So um, a lot of people said there are a lot of problems when you take a look only at income inequality. Even though Gini coefficient in Thailand have been constant or slightly decreasing, it is considered pretty high among the Southeast Asian country and Southeast Asian country. Thailand is the fourth among them in, in 2018. And the second research from Boy Ung Pakon Economic Research Institution in 2020, they found that um, those low income family uh, that have a sig significant share of that income, uh, actually, it comes from transfer. It doesn't come from their nature of their work or more opportunity in their life. So it's actually uh, the Gini coefficient that reflect the income inequality in Thailand is underestimated. And on top of that, we don't really have the data for top 1% income. They might report something, but uh, we the socioeconomic survey in Thailand doesn't really look deeper into what's going on in this top five and top 1% income. Another um, piece of study by Vanijaran Tam and Jen Mana said, if tax data is included to you know, calculate the Gini coefficient, it will be a lot higher than this. So, I think income inequality might not tell any story about Thailand inequality. So I just uh, move on to other indicator that could tell me something about the story after the military coup. The poverty rate. So there is a huge report from World Bank uh, released in 2019. They talk about uh, Thailand poverty. They said household income and consumption growth in Thailand have been stalled nat nationwide with a larger decline among households at the bottom of income distribution. And actually Thailand poverty rate increased twice after the military coup in 2014. It increased the first time in 2016 and another time in 2018. It was the, the first time since the year 2000, and it is the only ASEAN country, Southeast Asian nation, 
to experience several increase in the poverty since 2000. So they dig deeper into the reason behind the poverty increase these two times. They said it mainly come from the vulnerability to shock and poor economic condition. We have we had rapid uh, we have rapid aging population. We have very low quality of education. Thailand's education, uh, the quality of education score dropped a lot compared to the rest of the region. And one third of the labor force in Thailand is still employed in the low productivity, agricultural and so, uh, service sector. When I break down the poverty into the regional uh, data, this is percent of people living under poverty by region. You see overall, yes, it's going down, right? Um, but it uh, increased a little bit in uh, 2016 and increased again in 2018. The 18 one is higher. Bangkok is the, you know, the wealthiest province in Thailand because it's a capital uh, province. So they have the lowest percent of people living un under poverty. Central is around Bangkok. So they are pretty close to Bangkok. Um, Northern is following. The interesting piece here I can see is you see the yellow line, it is not Eastern region. It used to be the poorest region in the past. The Southern is the, this light blue line. They used to be pretty wealthy in the past. Right now, the Southern surpassed the Northeastern in terms of percent of people living under poverty in this. And I think it is interesting because in the past, Southern people tend to be more of the conservative. You know, they support the military coup. They uh, support the military government and they are against Thaksin and Yingwak. But right now, when a lot more poverty increase in, in the Southern part of Thailand, I think it could lead to some change in the political beliefs. That's one factor I observe. Another survey by World Bank, they take a look at the perception regarding living standards in Thailand. And they found that it has been worsened starting in 2016. Uh, the graph on the top is people who reported not enough money for shelter in the past year. The light blue one is the share of people who said they don't have enough money for shelter. And the bottom one is not enough money for food. You can see that the light blue uh, bar is a lot bigger starting in 2016. I am not saying that it is directly from military coup, but this is my observation that uh, the situation happened after the military coup. And then I move to another indicator. Um, when we talk about income, we talk about just the flow of money. But when we look at wealth, uh, Gini coefficient, you all know, I, I believe wealth is the stock variable. It includes everything, um, how many house, how many piece of land you have, you know, stock bonds and everything you own. So if we take a look at wealth Gini coefficient in Thailand, this is from Global Wealth Report, multiple years uh, from Credit Suisse. It is rising and it's, it's actually considered among the top in the world. In 2018, some report even say Thailand has the most unequal in terms of wealth inequality. It dropped a little bit in 2019 and I don't really have uh, data after that. So break into the wealth by DESO. I bring uh, two years data. 
2012 and 2019. 2012 is before the military coup. 2019 is after, and it is the latest data I could find in terms of wealth share. So you see, this is by um, DSO. So the first 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 90% of people in Thailand have lower wealth share. You see the <laughs> poorest one, normally they have 0.1% of the wealth. It becomes 0, 0.0 something that I can't really come uh, put the number here. Every group of income here have lower wealth share, except the top 10% of people. They grow wealth from 70 to 76.6% after the military coup. Another piece of wealth we can look at is the amount of money deposited in the banks. This is uh, uh, the data from Bank of Thailand. You see that uh, they, they have the group of account, the account up to zero baht, baht is local currency in Thailand, zero baht up to 200,000 baht. Uh, it was around 90 something percent of the number of account. They used to have 15% of the amount money deposited in 2013. In 2020, it was 8%. In the middle range, 200,000 to 10 million baht, I would say this is middle class. Uh, the amount of money deposit share used to be 44% of the total. Right now, they are dropping to 39%. The rich people who, had, who have over 10 million baht, they used to have 41% of the amount money deposit in Thailand. Right now, they're growing that deposit. This is 2020, even after the COVID hit. So they grow their money deposit to 53%. We are not even talk about their deposit offshore, outside the country. This is only uh, in Thailand, reported from Bank of Thailand. So in terms of inequality, this is my observation. The income inequality shows slightly decreasing trend in Thailand. There is no data available for top 5% and 10%. And the, the survey that Thai, Thai government used is household socioeconomic survey. It did not have any income category higher than 100,000 baht per month, which is this one is considered upper uh, middle income class. In terms of poverty, it was increasing twice after mi the military coup in 2016 and 2018 and the poverty in the southern region surpassed the northeastern since 2017. Wealth inequality is, I think it's the most obvious. In Thailand, it is among the highest in the world and top 10% grow their wealth rapidly after the coup. So even before COVID-19, are there any movement? Are there any resistance from the poor? Yes, there was. Uh, and the uh, latest movement, we call it red shirt because they use red as their symbol. Uh, they represent the urban lower middle class and the poor. They come out on the street and travel from northeastern region, northern region, and all over the country to, to Bangkok and block the street in, in Bangkok here. They basically protest against the Prime Minister Apisit Vechashiwa, who is who became Prime Minister because of the military coup. This happened in 2009, 2009 and 2010, but in, it ended up in tragedy. The military cracked down the red shirt movement. They killed nearly 100 people. So that's what happened before the COVID. So
So let's look at COVID effect. This is number of COVID cases in Thailand as of October 2nd. Today is October 21st. So a little bit, um, it might change a little bit. So it peaked, the number of cases peaked during, you know, um, August and then drop a little bit in, in September and October. The people fully vaccinated as of October 2nd, it was 22.8%. So it's not even half of the country that got vaccination. And there's a lot of issue about vaccination in Thailand. GDP growth projected from IMF they project at 1% in 2021. Inflation is very low. You can see the dip in GDP growth uh, during 2020. By sector, you can see that this is from Bank of Thailand. Um, every sector dropped from COVID, but the biggest drop happened in accommodation and, um, and uh, leisure activities, which is, tourism sector, tourism related sector, because 20% of Thailand's GDP is from tourism sector, tourism and tourism related activities. And 20% of formal employment are employed in this sector. Uh, in Thailand, tourist arrival number hit 40 million in 2019, and a lot of them are from China. So when the pandemic uh, hit, it put a sudden stop in tourism flow and significant contract in economic activity. There are a lot of estimation about the effect from COVID-19 to tourism sector in Thailand. Uh, ADB made a projection for the worst case uh, Thailand could lose 2.4% of GDP. This is just uh, one sector. The Asian Foundation released a report from their survey in September 2020. They survey micro, small, and medium enterprise, especially in tourism sector, and also the worker. And they found that nearly half of the business owner indicated that their business was highly vulnerable to closing permanently. 63% of the owner of tourism business were either in high risk or already closed permanently. So it got hit very hard. And on top of that, the inequality happened in terms of labor mobility. The flexibility of moving online is unequal, right? Agricultural and tourism related sector cannot be moved online. And on top of that, only 3% of poor household report having computer with internet connection. So there is no infrastructure or any supporting system for them to move anything online. So those are the effect uh, to the tourism sector. On top of everything, we also have huge informal sector and the estimation from National Statistic Office in 2018, they found that around 21.2 million workers or 55% 55, 55 of total employment were engaged in the informal sector. Thailand population is around 70 million. This is a huge share of the total population. And of course, when COVID hit, they are the very first group who got laid off, who got let go, right? So they've, they experienced dramatic in decrease in their monthly income and they do not have any income security or welfare. They are excluded from more social protection measure. So this is a huge, huge group that got affected from COVID-19. So from all of those factors, I sit down and think about the factor that could lead to uh, the movement, you know, pro-democracy movement, the negative and positive factor. 
And of course, the poor and lower middle class are the biggest in number. Their political power actually used to be strong from 1997 constitution. That was a while ago, long time ago. That constitution is considered people's constitution because it benefits a lot of people. However, when the military uh, could take place, they re rewrote everything. So they have their own constitution. So right now we are using 2017 constitution, which benefit more of the elite class. So what are the positive factors that can support the pro-democracy movement in Thailand. The first one is, of course, the gap of economic and political power. It has been widened and maintained by the new constitution that was written by the military appointed personnel. There is growing poverty and inequality in the Southern region. So it should add some more supporter in terms of you know, anti-government and pro-democracy movement. However, there are a lot more negative factors to slow down or stop the pro-democracy movement. The first one is COVID pandemic itself and the COVID related restriction. Not a lot of people want to come out and you know, be among a lot of people during this time. And Thai government have a very strong COVID restriction. So you can get arrested after if you come out after the curfew, things like that. And I, I think economic recession hurt the low and middle income the most. So their priority might change from, you know, I really hate the government, but I have to make my living. I have to feed my family first. So their priority might change because of that. And the main reason, I think, the negative factor, the big negative factor that slowed down the pro-democracy movement is the military government used the reason for peace and order to arrest protesters, silence the voice against the government, censor a lot of Facebook posts and media. Thai police cracked down on the protesters, and, and on top of that, they devalue the protester. So instead of calling protester, pro-democracy protester, they are calling them terrorists. They are calling them something else, you know, to devalue these people. And we also have the, the law. If you are commenting or talk about the royal family, they can use royal defamation law, which the punishment is very heavy. Example, a man was sentenced to 35 years in jail for his Facebook post and comment about royal family. So it, it is a big threat to this pro-democracy movement. So I, I think the condition from the inequality is growing. However, there are a lot more negative uh, factor that slow down the pro-democracy movement because the cost of making political unrest for the poor and lower middle class are a lot higher from this. Another uh, important factor come from upper middle class group. Interestingly, um, um, this upper middle class group account for around 21%. This is from the study from Ton and Shannon in 2017. Uh, there is some explanation why upper middle class are not supporting the, the democracy in Thailand. Jen Mana and Gethin say, these middle class and elites lost their relative economic and political power to the poor since 2000. It was started from Thaksin, the ex-prime minister who have a lot of policy towards the poor and the upper middle class and the elites feel like they are losing a lot of economic power during that time. Another study by Kanuk Rat Le Chu Skun 
just published in 2021, uh, she gave an explanation on Thai middle class, which at first they promoted democracy and then later on they turned against it. Uh, she said there are two reasons why Thai upper middle class act like that. The first one is they don't have sufficient understanding of majority rules. Uh, they, do, they don't really understand what democracy is. And they have learned from the uncertainty of the free election in the past that the government can benefit other class, but not them. So they hesitate and then turn themselves to support the military government more. So the last one, how does it relate to the latest youth democracy movement? Who are they? If you follow the news a little bit uh, last year, you will see this kind of picture. It's high school and college students come out to protest against the, the government. Who are they? They, there is no official survey or study about them, uh, many study about them. So I got one survey from um, November 18 protester, uh, pro protest profile survey. It was by nerdnextdoor.com. You can, you can tell it's not very uh, official. <laughs> um, they found that 49% of these protesters come from Generation Y. Uh, there are two groups of Generation Y. This is one group of Generation Y. 23 to 31 year old, 49% of them. 17% come from Generation Z, younger than 22 year old. And 16% come from 32 to 40 year old. 44% of them say, this is my first time come out to protest. How did they start? This youth uh, democracy movement, their background didn't come from, you know, very poor family or uh, middle-class family. Some of them, yes, come from middle-class family. But the starting point, I think it come from the dissolution of one party called Future Forward Party. This party is very new party and uh, their policy is pretty much the same as you know, the agenda that the new generation is talking about. They're talking about climate change. They're talking about social injustice. They're talking about uh, inequality. So the young generation in Thailand feel like this party represent them, pretty much represent them. But from the political game, you know, they were dissolved in February 2020. So a lot of young generation become really angry because of that. And the uh, executive of this party, very young, were banned from the politics for 10 years. So what happened after that dissolution of this dissolution of the party? Flash mob happened in 47 university campus in 27 province in Thailand. They attract a lot of people in July 20, uh, on July 18, one group called Free Youth Group attract more than 2,500 participants to do the flash mob in Bangkok. And then their main agenda they, they have three demands. First, they want government to end the action against people who are exercising their right. Pretty much, they just want freedom of speech. You know, They want to express their opinion uh, freely. The second demand is they want the government to dissolve the parliament and have a new election. The third one is they want a new constitution that is not military written uh, constitution. And after that, 
it keep going and the movement keep you know growing in number and sometime during september and october it grow to 50000 to 100000 people participated so there is some study about this youth movement uh, the study by Le Chu Skun in 2021, she conducted a survey of these protesters. Why are you here? She asked those uh, kids. They said um, they were motivated by grievance against repressive, authoritarian, authoritative, and unaccountable conservative, especially in education system. They see the inequality and uh, not so transparent in political institution, particularly the monarchy. They ask question, why the royal family or the monarchy got that a lot, you know, the government budget will give some money to the monarchy. They question that, why do we have to give that money to the monarchy when the country is in crisis of COVID-19? And another group of students from the university student, they link that problem to authoritarian military government and link to the constitution, the latest constitution and the intervention in politics by the monarchy. So they pretty much threaten the conservative foundations in Thailand. They demand educational equality between urban and rural area they campaign for personal freedom, social equality, and mutual respect for gender identity. They, it is the first time that someone publicly criticized the monarchy. And they call for abolition, abolition of the Les Majesty Law, or so-called Section 112 of Thailand's criminal code demand more accountability from the royal family expenditure. There is none for the report, you know, when the, when the royal family uh, spend on something, they do not have the detail of the expenditure at all. So I think I see this as kind of generation crash. The older generation in Thailand have been growing in the society that, you know, socialize in hierarchical social structure, the seniority and inequality is normal thing. If you ask uh, some of the older people in Thailand, we were born like this, I am okay to live like this. There is no problem of unequal uh, system. So inequality is not only nature, but moral in Thailand in the past. However, younger generation, you know, they have access to information. They learn to make independent decision. They do not have to depend on their family or parents much anymore. So they decide to uh, what kind of work they want, what kind of education they want, and they make decisions on their own in terms of political participation. Um, they also more internationalize and international youth movement, the inequality and social justice are the main issue of, of those movement. And the picture on the right, you see pretty cute, Milk Tea Alliance. That is the symbol that show the cooperation of the youth democracy movement in Thailand, in Hong Kong, and in Taiwan. So if you have, uh, if you search hash, hashtag Milk Tea Alliance on Twitter, you will see they communicate with each other a lot. They learn from each other the tactic of having flash mob, how how should you do when the government have tear gas or use water cannon? The tactic like that, they, they tell each other and learn from each other. So Thai youth 
movement are more you know internationalized and learn more from those. So what is the linkage of youth movement and the previous pro-democracy movement? How do I link these two together? Some younger generation, they actually have personal and family experience from poverty and COVID pandemic. They actually acknowledge the previous democracy movement, especially the red shirt. They study more on in terms of political history Right now, political history book become top sales across country because of this, uh, younger generation become more interested in this. And new generation from Northeastern. I mentioned before that Northeastern uh, region used to be the poorest. So these younger generation from Northeastern region become the leader and act as a speaker in the Bangkok-based protest. And those are uh, the leader people, Jatupat Bun Pataraksa or so called Pai Daudin, Atapon Bopat, and Anun Nampa. Two of them right now are in prison because of that uh, Section 112 or Les Majesty Law. And we don't really see the future that they can come out and become the leader again. So it's pretty sad. Um, what is the role of Thailand's youth movement in terms of supporting the lower and middle income uh, if they want to come out and protest in the future. I think um, youth movement use their own, use their advantages in advanced technological skill and raise more question about the government. Lately, the government just published, you know, the government budget in the very messy Excel and PDF file. These young generation get that file and write, wrote the code to extract the data and question the government. Uh, they say, this budget is for COVID-19. Why do you spend a lot more on construction uh, project, things like that, you know? So um, I think lower, middle class income people and the poor people benefit from this question because it bring more transparency to the government. This youth movement can support the lower middle class and the poor for you know social movement technique. And they actually act as, I think they act as a spark or catalyst to the lower middle income since other civil organization have been silenced and limit themselves to express the political view. So in conclusion, I am revisit my question. Is Thailand inequality growing after 2014? The income inequality didn't tell any story. It's not rising. However, the wealth inequality is rising after 2014 coup. Cool. The poverty rate increased twice after the coup. Cool. It was the first time of the increase after 2000. What is the effect of COVID-19 to the middle class and the poor? It sent tremendous shock to uh, labor, especially in the service sector. And the first shock hit on tourism sector and generate another shock to consumption and investment in another sector, in other sectors. And also Thailand, have another 50% of the labor in the informal sector, which by nature is vulnerable and um, related to, oops, sorry, related to um, lowest paid job. And the last one is, oops, sorry. Last question, can inequality and poverty explain the democracy movement in 2020? I said they are not directly linked to the poor and lower middle class, but they share the same agenda about inequality and social injustice. And the youth movement sparked the public interest to question more on the, uh, on the government. So that concludes my presentation and observation about Thailand. Thank you.
Thank you so very much. Um, that was a great presentation um, as well. So now we will open up the floor to any questions or comments or anything like that. Um, I'll start us off if that's okay. I do have a question for Wolfram. Um, you mentioned that the current institutions have a lower transaction cost than um, you know, the newer institutions because of the institutional hysteresis um, that you talked about. Is there anything or that we know that could overcome these transaction costs that could persuade you know, society to you know, join these new current movements that are being discussed? Yeah, may I ask directly, uh, answer directly? Yes, of course. Okay, yeah. Um, interesting question. Um, I, I uh, hinted to, to the issue that, uh, to the ideal benchmark in um, if the, uh, the the if we were able to develop a culture of instrumentalism of of problem solving we would never have uh, the barriers you know these barriers that 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 uh, make existent uh, um, institutions run into hysteresis phases because uh, in a in a general culture of um, being based on on facts and science uh, we would um, be able to develop a much more smoother uh, a transition of, of institutional uh, change from one institutional arrangement to institutional reform so to speak um, you see the 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 the, the thailand case uh, the thailand case is is about uh, and it's wonderful how the two papers uh, basically uh, uh, connect. Um, it's all about a petrified institutions, uh, hierarchical, uh, very much uh, um, a ceremonial uh, military is perhaps one of the most ceremonial uh, institutional arrangement at all. Uh, and the search of the of the democracy movements, say call it democracy movement or, or youth movement or whatever, uh, or protest movement, it is a search for for a or you can mirror it as a search for 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 a more adequate institutional arrangements and 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 the the value culture the value basement of society um, uh, um, uh, below that under underpinning that and that is the, the 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 point we have to imagine I think it's a it's all a question of our political imagination as well imagine as Veblen did I mean you know uh, imagine always the the contrary the the, the better benchmark, how would a society look like if we, if we had a culture and, and value base of, of being at the problems, defining the problems, defining the commons, uh, getting aware of the, the, the problems of commons and, and, and joint action and collective action and common action. Um, then uh, if that culture could be pushed forward, um, institutional change would not be that petrified anymore, you know, but we open it up into a more smoother uh, and more timely uh, continuing change. That was the idea of, I mean, Vavlin was not a revolutionary, was not a Marxist, of course, you know, but he was more in the ideal of uh, society being able to be more continuous and, and smoothly um, a, a, a changing its um, its uh, in, institutional structure. But you know that question probably is not solved yet whether whether these societies are able for for reform and continuing reform or sometime it it will perhaps break up in in major revolutions. you know the the the, the uh, Thailand case um, shows me that that it is, you know, undecided yet whether whether it can be changed by reform or a revolution will occur at some point. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I might add a little bit on that. Um, in Thailand's case, I think it's time that will solve because this younger generation will grow up and they already started something by questioning a lot of things that 
not so many old generation or even my generation there to talk about, you know. So they started something already. So I think if these people become, uh, you know, more, have more power politically and economically, they could lead to some change, gradually change, if there is no revolution in Thailand. Yeah, and they represent, if I may add that one phrase, they do represent a different uh, value uh, value system. You know, that is probably the, the most basic and the most important thing. Amitava, do you have a question? Yes, yes, uh, right. if I could. Uh, uh, Prabhupada, that was a um, very informative and wide-ranging talk. I won't go into too many uh, details, but one interesting idea is to look at um, what, what you've done is to look at young, younger people and um, even use words like generation, this or that. And those are very American phenomenon and I get very irritated by people who use that in such a loose way generations are not all the same okay there are all kinds of gaps and and also it is very easy to to say some things in answer to some questions and show up in protest I'm 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 not I'm not criticizing or making fun of these people on the other hand it's also well known that as you grow up um, you you become a lot of people tend to become very conservative. They, they don't have the, uh, the time. And so um, I, I wish you good luck, but this is, I would take this in a more critical way rather than, you know, it's always good to have hope, but this idea that young people will rescue the world, I think is, uh, yeah, is, is, is overly uh, optimistic. And, and also I'd like to, um, to suggest that you, you don't rely on, uh, these so-called theories of Achamoglu and Robinson, because um, what, what, what have they contributed to anything you've done? Nothing, I think, okay? And in fact, I can guarantee you that their work would not be given any attention unless they were um, in, in uh, uh, elite universities and, and in control of journals. So, Please, I, I would ask you to look at their work more critically because it is really, um, it's it's one of the worst books I've seen. That <laughs> you know the the uh, why why nations um, fail. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, but but it's very interesting, and and I'm I'm sorry that I'm a old guy. I'm giving you some advice about uh, what what perhaps you should do now for Wolfram. Um, that was a very broad ranging talk. And um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit sort of dissatisfied in the following way that, um, you know, you're, you're talking about different things like one is about mathematical te techniques uh, such as hysteresis, okay, such as complexity, okay. Uh, even tools from game theory, okay, which which are really sort of I consider to be formal tools. Uh, of course, they need some some uh, basis to look at them. And then you're also looking at some sort of theory in an unspecified way. And finally, you're looking at the real world and what is going on in terms of climate change. And uh, so, what what I'm finding very difficult to understand is what do you mean by collapse, okay? Because we have a lot of theories of crises and instabilities. So I, I would take some issue about your, your, your uh, characterization that heterodox economists don't talk about collapse, okay? If we mean by collapse the end of the world, that's one thing, right? But, but uh, you know, so what exactly is a collapse? And also what exactly are institutions? I mean, I, I like the work of many of the people you mentioned, like Veblen especially, but one of the reasons they, they have not had a bigger following is that they, it's not very clear what the theoretical apparatus really consists of. And, and uh, you know, uh, 
you 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 don't define an institution even i i suppose by that you mean uh, laws and customs and uh, habits uh, shared habits and maybe even organizations but they were so quickly taken over by this new institutionalists like Douglas North and his, his followers that I'm a little concerned about just leaving it at institutions um, and, and also uh, not defining um, this, this um, collapse more clearly. Anyway. Yeah, Paul, who answers first? Who will answer first? Um, I can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, um, I will look at um, those critical framework more critically. And thanks for, for the suggestion and recommendation. Like I said, I am very new to this field and your suggestion is very <laughs> valuable. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, may I ask Iris? Am I ask? Uh, I answer Iris. Of course, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, Amitava, uh, nice to have you here. Wonderful. Uh, I, I saw you on the list already and uh, was was happy to see that. Uh, yes. I mean, you touch probably the two most uh, the two most uh, fundamental issues here. I I I, I do use uh, formal method math, uh, formal mathematical um, uh, and a, a formal mathematical approach if you want. I had no math at all, no formalities in this talk, but in the back of course there are there are basic models or a class of models basically where I refer to. And then as you as you realized, I use a conceptual, uh, theories um, which have a kind of, 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 of middle, middle level of abstraction, so to speak, typically evolutionary institutional, institutionalist, Veblenian type uh, um, theories and conceptions or pattern models, if you like. Um, and then I, I, I have the real world and uh, examples. And of course, each step uh, that is basically three relations between the three uh, need, would need to be reflected uh, themselves. Uh, that, that, that is something that I, I did very, very basically in the paper itself, in the published, in the published article, which is longish, um, but um, exactly this is what what one would uh, work on furthermore I mean if, if you look at these modernist complexity uh, uh, people um, like Brian Arda and all these people of course they have little uh, little epist epistemological reflection uh, they use their models they they immediately draw consequences for reality etc cetera, etc cetera. this is something that we heterodoxists basically uh, should do and develop uh, a focus in and 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 a relative advantage uh, uh, for us um, and 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 put stress on 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 that methodological and epistemological um, uh, reflection. I did that in a lot of different papers where I used these formalities and discussed, like in 2012 paper on the 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 theory of institutional change revisited that is the 2012 the 2012 paper where after 25 years uh, of dale bush's paper uh, i i tried a exemplarily so to speak i tried a formalization uh, of the institutionalist theory of institutional change using uh game uh, games and and that and there i had a lot of of, of methodological reflection, how can I use that? What um, what deductions am I able and allowed to to draw uh, for theory, for empirical um, uh, relations, etc. So um, 
it's 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 all but uh, but settled. Of course, you know, you you open up that box that is in the center of of our uh, research, struggling <laughs> and, and theorizing, struggling. The second the second thing is 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 even more relevant. I think even more relevant. I mean, could it be more relevant than epistemological reflection? No. But uh, another uh, critical point. Look, collapse is something we talk in everyday language now on, in the terms of ecological collapse, you know. Everyone is speaking about um, a potential ecological collapse if um, certain functions of, of our natural environment uh, do not work anymore. Uh, if the the net of of the network of diverse species, for instance, is reduced to a threshold like forty percent is endangered now, uh, what would the our natural environment look like? Uh, can humans still uh, live make a living as a society uh, on sixty percent of the of the species diversity we have now? Okay. Uh, let's say in 30, 40 years or so, is it still possible? Or do um, humans uh, go to completest extinction? Yeah, well, collapse, you could say it's kind of in extinction. So far, as you say, we have talked about crisis. We know what we, we define crisis. We know um, in complex, we, we know from pro Marxian political economy about crisis, of course, you know. Um, we know from complexity economic uh, modeling and simulation, we, we know about deterministic chaos, phase transitions. We know that the system changes, you know. We know about, um, um, uh, um, what is it called? Uh, um, yeah, well, basically system change where the, the, the character and the dynamics of a system um, show completely different um, different forms and ways, you know. So it might go into overcomplexity. It might have a, a lasting crisis for some time, switch back to undercomplexity, and so on. You know, that is something that that we know quite well from 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 dozens of or hundreds of of computer simulations on on systems. It will is this probably. It is not very probable that I speak of collapse and would claim that hum humanity in total would go to extinction. That is probably not the case. But we know of, of institutional arrangements that go to extinction. And it is not, there's certainly not a logical second where there's nothing in terms of institutions. I, I agree with you completely. So collapse is something that is a nice, a nice term taken from, from topical uh, ecological discussions, but needs to be uh, clearly defined in terms of systems dynamics for institutions and for biological humans. Do we necessarily uh, go to extinction if our old institutions go to extinction? Huh? We certainly will have something. Um, I tell you in two phrases, I tell you my favorite, my favorite joke. Uh, two planets in the universe uh, meet again. And the one says, oh, how, how nice to see you, but how are you looking like? You are, you are, look so, so bad. What, what's going on with you? The other one says, oh, don't, don't ask me. It's, I, I have homo sapiens. Oh, the other one says, oh, that is, that is, oh, that is one of the worst you can imagine. I, it's very sorry for you, but I can, I can, um, Tell you one thing: this uh, this illness uh, uh, ends uh, at some point suddenly. Yeah, so that that would be something that is not so far away. Um, I mean, in German, I, I I I can I can talk I can give that joke better than than in English. Sorry, I I need to translate. I need to make that joke for myself in English so that it has has a better a better clue. But um, still, the point is. Um, can we go beyond crisis, beyond um, uh, uh, regime regime change in 
in, in, in uh, formal simulations, et cetera? What does it mean for institutions? What does it mean for, for biological life of humans? Okay, I'd leave it open, but that is, these are the points you mentioned. If, if, if I could just add to what do you call the joke, is that perhaps the collapse of hu humanity would be a good thing for <laughs> resurgence of the system. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, that's what the joke says, I mean. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not really a joke. I think it's, uh, you know, we, we are too species centric, okay, for our own good. Yeah, uh, let me mention uh, there's one book I don't have it. I don't have the the order, nor I have cited it um, in in that article somewhere in the beginning. Um, there are books that that um, take a planetary uh, and, and universal approach. I think it's they are physicians or so. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, physicists. <laughs> um, and they um, consider different planets in the universe uh, where, where they have a, a, li a living population uh, that uh, go uh, uh, excessively, uh, that use excessively their resources. And they claim that there are hundreds and thousands and millions perhaps of, of X, um, of planets with X living uh, living populations, um, and they make a, a kind of, of sorting uh, according to several uh, criteria. Sorting of, of planets that have it had it behind them, and uh, uh, planets uh, certain conditions where planets are still have lastingly um, these these populations, whatever kind of populations. Um, um, so populations that overuse the their planets or not. Um, and we obviously apparently belong to that kind of planets with the fate of a, pop, a popular popular population on it uh, that still overuses uh, the resources of the planet. So you can take a huge, you know, a, a, a macro, macro, macro uh, perspective on, on all that. And physicists are making most interesting contributions here. Well, yeah, but well, say, yeah. well if I could just, just interrupt you for a second, is that it's not uh, we are doing something. Okay, it is a very small fraction of the world which is doing it. Okay, most of the people of the world are not not really, and I bet these physicists are meeting at conferences, flying jet planes to 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 contribute to this because they have too much time and too much money, <laughs> and and probably so do we. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank I don't you. comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are at time, but I really, I truly enjoyed this. Um, I loved how these two sessions really went together. And um, if you have any final comments or questions, I'm sure we can send the email addresses, you know, and link the author's bios as well as papers. Um, this has been recorded, so we will post it to the ASE YouTube channel. So take a look at that. And again, thank you so much to our presenters and our attendees today. Yeah, thank you, Iris, thank for, you, for arranging all that. Yes, of course. So successful with that format. Wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad it worked out. Thank you. you everyone. Two papers. You pick two papers that fit to each other. In the first instance, I thought, hey, what do they have to do with each other? But when I saw <laughs> Prowse uh, files yesterday, I thought, well, well chosen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. Yes, very yeah. interesting. Thank yeah, you thanks, so much, thanks Iris, and thank Prowpan, and of course, Wolfram. It was great. Yeah. And, and maybe Zoom conferences or workshops are the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you everyone have a great day bye bye